Today in Rangeland Principles, we're going to think a little bit about why plants occur where, do, where they do on the globe. This is Karen Launchbaugh, and we're going to talk about climate on rangelands because that's what gives rise to these different ecosystems. Biogeography, you may have heard that term before. It's the, the study of the distribution of species across the globe. So the topics that we talk about today are going to be related to biogeography. Let's get started. First of all, here's something you probably know, but let's make sure that we're to distinguish between the fact that today we're talking about climate, not necessarily weather, um, but climate are those long-term regional patterns, you know, that have like uh, xeric climates or mesic climates or just these things that you expect to occur in a region. Weather are the more short-term, year-to-year, short-term levels of precipitation, a wind, humidity, you know, it was a cold winter or a wet spring, those would be climate. So let's think clearly about how climate affects vegetation patterns. We think mostly about vegetation patterns as different amounts of biomass, for example. Well, that's driven by photosynthesis. And remember, photosynthesis is light plus water and carbon dioxide. And so if you've got a lot of light or a lot of water or conditions for photosynthesis, that's going to change the kind of plants that are out there. So it determines the growing season, it determines how much biomass can occur and what type of biomass appear, uh, occurs on a site. So for example, we would pretty easily recognize different vegetation patterns like uh, deserts, uh, forests, or tundra. And those are all affected by the different kinds of animals, the sh or I'm sorry, the kinds of plants, the shrubs, the forbs, or the grasses. And then some plants have uh, photosynthetic systems that work really well in hot and dry conditions. Those are C4 or um, warm season plants. Others do really well where it's cold and, and moist. And so those would be the more the C3 plants. So the, the plant specific systems determine whether it's able to survive in different levels of light, heat, cold, moisture, salt, etc. Climate also affects the type of soil that the plants live on. Those temperature and precipitation patterns influence the soil texture and structure. Of course, the parent material is very important, but then the rate at which that or that mineral matter breaks down and the amount of organic matter in the soil is highly influenced by precipitation and temperature. Those, pattern, those things uh, determine how um, minerals are, are leached through the soil and how much organic matter occurs in the soil. So basically what weather is doing is it's altering the chemical and physical weathering properties of soil. So how quickly soil develops. Okay, let me give you an example. Gelosols, that's the soil here on the left. That's an, an arctic soil or a polar soil, something that you find in the tundra. So it's very cold and it's quite moist up there. So uh, water doesn't move through the soil very quickly. Those chemical and physical properties do not occur at those lower, as quickly at those lower um, temperatures. So therefore we just have really slow and less developed soils. Uh, one advantage of that um, of the tundra is it has those freezing and thawing patterns which kind of break up the soil and, and affect some of the chem physical properties of those mineral materials. So that's an advantage. But still, we're not seeing a lot of movement or soil development. On the other extreme is the oxisol. That's that red soil in the middle. That warm temperature and the warm precipitation of the top tropics where oxisols are uh, really creates a situation where water can move through the soil and leach out some of those minerals and it so the soils are not very rich in organic matter and then also there's really quick chemical um, weathering because of those warm temperatures it really um, facilitates the chemical reactions that allow the soil to be kind of broken down and weathered in the middle would be the mollusols that's all on that soil on the right hand side these are the grassland soils especially those temperate grasslands and here we've got pretty good moisture and pretty good precipitation, but it's slow enough that that organic matter, as you can see that dark layer at the top, that organic matter can form. We don't have as much leaching through the soil. And so this is that's really good kind of a middle ground for having some chemical development and physical weathering, but not so much that the soil just gets totally leached like the oxisols. So think about ecosystems. Uh, versus communities of organisms and the abiotic environment. So the communities of org organisms might be like the school of fish or the herd of bison or the stand of, of a, a saguaro cactus. And then the abiotic environment is the patterns of precipitation and temperature. 
So we're going to talk a little bit about ecosystems now that include the organ organisms, the communities of organisms, and then the temperature and precipitation patterns. At a really gross level, we have what we call biomes. Biomes are that largest recognizable unit that you can uh, determine is an ecosystem. So those biomes would be things like tundra, uh, grasslands, chaparral, desert scrub, savannas. Those, when you walk into them, you know that you're in that ecosystem. And so those are called uh, the, the biomes. And you can see where they kind of uh, are layered across the US, I'm sorry, across the globe. And for example, in those upper um, upper latitudes, there's that brownish red color. That's a taiga. That's a, a northern forest. So that's only found up there. We we find those evergreen forests up in those upper uh, latitudes. In the middle, we might have those de deserts. You see the deserts of the southwestern U.S. and the deserts of Africa. We're going to talk a little bit more about why those occur where they occur. So to try to figure out where those different biomes occur, um, it's been pretty common to use this, this graph where you just uh, plot the different biomes on either precipitation or temperature. Notice on that um, x-axis, temperature is high on the left side and low on the right side, which is a little unusual. But what we see is that tropical rainforests occur where the temperature is fairly high and the precip is very high. On the other hand, we would have those uh, boreal forests and the, those taiga forests at places where the temperature is low on the right-hand side, but also precipitation is still very high. The bottom line is that the bottom part of this graph is where rangelands are. They're the tropical deserts, they're the grasslands, they're the tundra, they're the woodlands and scrublands. They don't get enough precipitation to be forests. So most of the forests are distinguished by um, having more precipitation and, and rangelands, of course, as we've talked before, are low precipitation. So the precipitation, temperature, soils, and topography are what influence where biomes occur across the globe. If you think about that uh, on just sort of a graph, here's that precipitation and that temperature. Again, the, the uh, tropical rainforest, the savanna would be a tropical grasslands, uh, and then the, t the tropical deserts would be places that are really hot and really dry. In the middle, you'd have these temperate areas, the deciduous forests, the temperate grasslands, the temperate deserts. On the left-hand side are the cooler climates, and so then that's where we have those northern coniferous forests or the taiga. And then we have the tundra, the grasslands of the cool, um, the cool climates are the tundra, and then the cold desert could, could be like the sagebrush steppe. That would be a cold desert. So we know that biomes occur across the globe because of precipitation and temperature, but what affects those two patterns, especially precipitation? One important concept is this concept of a Hadley cell. This occurs where um, precipitation is abundant right along the equator. That's where we have those tropical rainforests. And after that moisture falls out of the clouds, the, temp the air moves up and cool air starts to form up at the higher uh, latitudes or the higher altitudes and then it falls down to the earth it starts to pick up moisture moving towards the equator and then drops its moisture and then that air uh, which is warm by then moves up and then it starts to cool and it drops down again about 30 degrees so we have a pattern where we have lots of moisture at the equator where the as the air starts to rise it drops out its rain and then it gets to the higher um, altitudes and it, uh, it becomes cooler and then it falls down and it's dry at that point around the 30 degree uh, latitudes. So if on the left hand side you look at a picture of Africa and you see that that, that um, sandy part right in North Africa, that's really dry country and that's because that's right about 30 degrees. And then if north of that would be um, a higher another altitude where there's moisture and then below that is the equator. I'm um, just to make it a little bit more clear here is how those um, clouds kind of move across. This is a year long of clouds and what you see is look at that part of Africa and that, that's that 30 degrees area and then below that would be where the tropics are so right in that middle Africa is where that that would be the equator. Also, that north of the northern part of South America would be the equator. And then, of course, in the higher latitudes, 
we have lots of clouds and then over the ocean below the Africa and South America and Australia you start to see a lot of moisture also. Another effect is called the continental land effect. This is how moisture um, occurs across the continent. So you'll see of course along the uh, along the coasts where the continents are right up against the ocean, those large bodies of water, of course, um, give rise to lots of moisture. So what we see across the globe, maybe never thought about this, but what you see is lots of moisture right along the coasts. And then right in the middle of the, of the continents, you often see the dry areas. So for example, look at the middle of Australia. It's very tropical along the coast, the, especially the eastern coast. Um, and then in the middle, the further you get in, the more and more dry it gets. The same would be true of Eurasia and sort of the Mongolian highlands are very dry because they're in the in middle of that continent. Same is true of Africa and the U.S. So as you get inner, inside the continent, most of the moisture has already fallen off and the coasts are moist and the inner parts of the continents are tend to be dry. That's the continental land effect. Another factor that influences where moisture occurs inside of a continent is uh, the, our topographic effects. The best would be what we call the orographic barrier. So this is where moisture comes off of the ocean and then as it rises up uh, to go over a mountain, it becomes cooler and so it drops all of its moisture and the relative humidity uh, really decreases as it drops that moisture. So by the time it raises up and the temperature is low, it comes over those mountains and there either are no clouds or those clouds have just lost all their moisture. So cool air um, comes onto the leeward side of the slope and it's in what we call the rain shadow. So the best example would be for us here in North America, uh, the Pacific Ocean moisture comes from the west there and those clouds come off the ocean and they're full of moisture as they go up and they go over the Cascades, uh, the Cascade Mountains and the Sierra Nevadas, they rise up, they lose their moisture as they get cooler. And then by the time they get over these mountains, there, there's this whole area that's a rain shadow. And then as the, as the moisture moves across the Great Basin, it tends to um, often pick up more moisture from the, from the lakes and from the vegetation there. And then it will hit the Rocky Mountains and do the same thing, rise up, drop moisture on the windward side, and then it will be dry on the leeward side. So rain shadow, orographic effect, orographic barriers influence how moisture is um, interacting with topographic effects. If we put all these things together and we look at rangelands of the world, we've seen this before, but what we see is, of course, those green areas, the woodlands and savannas, those are some of the more moist types of vegetation of, of rangelands that we have, and those are um, just are along the tropical areas of the globe. And then we have uh, grasslands that are in, in the center. They're less moisture, but these are all in the center of continents uh, because it's dry there, because of those orographic effects, because of the continental effect. Uh, then the driest parts, what would be the shrublands or those barren lands, so that kind of uh, purplish color and then the brown barren lands, those are right along the that Hadley cell, that 30 degree latitude area. That's where we start to see those really drier areas. We see them in Australia and we see them in Northern Africa and then also in Southern South America, those dry shrubland areas. Uh, the tundra, of course, is where it's really cold and, and there's lots of moisture and those are at the very high latitudes. On, on the U.S., we're going to take a lot of, uh, we're going to look at some different vegetation types, and this map is going to show up again and again where moisture occurs in the U.S. Of course, in this class, we're studying rangelands, so nearly all the rangelands are on the west side of the Mississippi. There really aren't significant rangelands on the in the east side, except in in uh, uh, Florida, where the Florida Everglades are actually rangeland because they're a shrub shrubland type. If you go uh, to the west, you'll see things such as you'll see the Cascades and the uh, Sierra Nevada mountains, very green on the leeward side of them, very dry. So Nevada is, can be very dry. Southern California can be very dry because of that um, orographic effect of the mountains. And then you also see the Rocky Mountains going down through Montana, Utah, 
Wyoming, and then again you see an orographic effect on the leeward side that those red areas that are very dry in Wyoming, Nevada, I'm sorry, in Wyoming, Utah, and Arizona, and New Mexico. I want to talk a little bit about precipitation and how variable it is from year to year. One of the greatest um, things that defines rangelands is how variation from year to year in precipitation can be more important than how little precipitation we get. So those two characteristics really define rangelands. We get very little vegetation or very little precipitation and it varies extensively from year to year, much more than forests and other types of biomes. Uh, this is a, a study I'm going to show you that was done in southern Idaho and here you'll see the green bars that's annual precipitation and notice how much that can vary from about eight inches one year to um, certainly more than two times that in another or even three times a low year to a high year so we can we can have one to three or four times precipitation from year to year and that's how much it can vary another point to think about is not all moisture is created equal for plant growth um, there's this concept in rangelands that, that we have a time called effective precipitation. When would precipitation be most usable by plants? And for us in the northern climates, we usually think of April to June. You might have heard people say, well, if you don't get this rain by June, it's just not going to do any good. It's because the plants aren't going to be able to really take advantage of that moisture. So it really is important to have that spring moisture, that April to June moisture. I'm going to talk to you about a study that was done in the Raft River Valley of southern Idaho and it was it was started in the 50s in 1951 it was done by a professor at the University of Idaho and he was actually looking at the um, influence or I'm sorry the pr predominance of halogeton there's a big sheep die off in the 50s and so he got research to see how we could get rid of um, halogeton or how we widely spread it was and uh, this study that I'm going to show you some pictures from was in a shad scale site. So that is uh, in southern Idaho and that shad scale. So it was kind of a salty um, plain. And it was started in uh, 51. And I have pictures uh, throughout several regions of the study. OK, here's when it was started. You can see this is a beautiful shad scale site. Some of these grasses that you see in here are uh, bottle brush squirrel tail. We'll tell more about that. It's kind of a rocky site. It's not really terribly productive, but it, it's a very healthy site. So this is in the Jim Sage Mountains in the Raft River Valley. Um, this is a, this a particular picture was taken in a fairly close to average year. It was just a little bit below the 50 year average for that effective precipitation that April to June. So that dark green bar on the right is showing just a slightly lower lower effective precipitation and slightly below average annual precipitation also but still a pretty good year and then we had about three years of, of just uh, relatively uh, near or a little below normal precipitation this next year uh, for whatever reason it certainly looks a lot worse in 55 than it did in 51 um, we had a few they had a few years of, of less than average precipitation and that's what gave rise to really being able to see some of those uh, cacti little cacti growing there certainly shrubs but not a lot of grasses so 1958 was another year just a little bit below average. They've been having several years of just slightly below average precipitation. In 1961, they had another year below average, but notice on the precipitation graph, that green bar, that very little precipitation early in the spring. So the land's looking pretty tough. There's not much uh, grass. You'll see some shrubs. There is some halogeton and there's some shad scale in there. You might also have noticed there's not much shad scale here. It seems like it died off. They did some research and they pulled up some plants and they found out that there was a scale insect that was killing some of these shrubs. So this was not grazed, it was not fire, it was some scale index insects that were killing the shrubs. But now we've got um, two or three years of below average precipitation and it's really not looking as good as it did when, when the study was started 10 years before this. And now look what happens when we have a few years of above average precipitation. This was 1963, a few years later. And now we start to see some of those shrubs really coming back and, and those grasses and some orange colored forbs off to the distance. So, wow, a couple of years of good precipitation can make a difference. Now, another year, just a, another year later, another above, year, above average year of precipitation. And this was really good timing for spring moisture. And it brought on this orange flowered uh, globe mallow. 
So for, as far as I can see, you can see all this globe mallow. You start to see the grass really come on and the shrubs are also doing pretty well. Not a lot of space, not a lot of uh, rocks between the plants, You're starting to see the plants really come in. And in uh, the next year, 1965, uh, there also was, it was also a good year. Grass is doing well, shrubs are doing well. Uh, the timing and precipitation wasn't quite as right, so we don't have as many globe mallow plants, but certainly have good vegetation. And now I wanted to bring out a few, another decade later, 1974. Now the shrubs have started to come back. And this was a year of really below average precipitation, yet there's still quite a bit of vegetation out there. And that's because most of what you're seeing there are shrubs. So the point here is when there's very little precipitation, it's the shrubs that can take advantage of that. They have deeper roots, so they can often just de dig deeper into the soil and, and access some of the lower uh, horizons for moisture. So a lot of what you're seeing here are shrubs that had very low deep roots. You're also seeing some grass that was able to take advantage of some of the light rains that did occur. Now things change again. In 1976 they had several years of just kind of average precipitation and that grass has really had a chance to come back. So right now we you see an area that looks not too much different than that first slide that we had in 1951. Good stand of shrubs. The shrubs have recovered from that scale insect. A lot of grass. This little white thing in the middle, that little white uh, plant in the middle, that is actually a, a weed that's starting to come in. It's a tumble mustard. We're not seeing a lot of weeds. It's still looking pretty good, but we're starting to see just uh, maybe a little trouble on the horizon in 76. In 89, we had another dry year. Again, you can see those shrubs are still hanging in there. The grasses are doing okay because they, they have roots that are really close to the surface, so they can often take advantage of those small, just light rain events. Now, 1996, go ahead another uh, decade, and now that tumble muster that I told you about, that's really started to take over. So this looks really awful. It's, it's, there's actually quite a lot of biomass under that tumble mustard, but this was a, a year where it just looked awful. All of these pictures were taken in July. Uh, so even though the precipitation was fairly high here, uh, the plant that was able to take advantage of it was that tub, tumble mustard. And then uh, by 2002, another problem was occurring and th that orange that you see in this picture is cheatgrass. So again, there was no, sh there was no grazing. Uh, there was no fire. Uh, this is along a road, so maybe some of that cheatgrass came in from the road, but that cheatgrass is really making a nice uh, fuel bed here. If something uh, uh, came across the road uh, and started a spark, it could really go across this landscape easily. The shrubs are doing okay because they've got deep roots, but that cheatgrass is really starting to outcompete the native plants. So that red um, solid stand of plants is cheatgrass doesn't look very good. This is a rat relatively near to average precipitation year, but the cheatgrass was able to take advantage of it. So when I saw this picture, I was pretty disheartened and I came back uh, to this site another, a decade later and was excited to see this. Okay, this is uh, not a lot of vegetation. It was a definitely below average year, but the plants that were able to take advantage of this in the below average year were the native plants. So you see those shrubs doing well, uh, you don't see a lot of the um, bottle brush squirrel tail, but it's there. That's the, there's some little um, nubs of that, uh, little bunches of the um, bottle brush squirrel tail. And for whatever reason, the timing was off. It was a cold winter, and the cheatgrass wasn't up, able to come up as well. So things change when you had a cold winter. That 2013, uh, the cheatgrass just was not able to get a head start and get ahead of the perennial grasses. So the perennial grasses were able to come on and because their roots are deeper and because the shrubs roots are deeper, they were able to take advantage. So that's the kind of it, the changes that we can see just from year to year, depending on the timing of precipitation and how cold the winter is. So just to summarize, we had a year in uh, 1951 when they started the study big stand of shad scale and, and bottle brush squirrel tail. And by 2013, it's gone through a lot of changes, but those two plants are still there. And we have some other new invaders that are a problem. Okay, to bring it all to conclusion, those biomes that I talked about do occur in very predictable places across the globe. And let's focus specifically in North America. We've got those grasslands in yellow right down the middle of the continent. 
in gray we have those the forest that's the rocky mountains and the cascade mountains that gray color the great basin is that desert and semi-desert area that kind of tan colored mediterranean climates are climates that get precipitation in the winter and so that's a whole different climate usually a grassland type of climate and then the really drier areas are those deserts and semi-deserts which you see in arizona new mexico and then down into texas and uh, down into uh, mexico also so that's the drier climates and those are occurring just because as you get into uh, new, uh, mexico and texas you're getting closer to that 30 degree hadley cell as you go northern uh, up north you're seeing the effect of the um, the orographic effect of the rocky mountains and the cascades and sierra nevadas those are just a few concepts to think about why plants occur where they do and how climates on rangelands influence uh, the amount of vegetation we have the kind of vegetation we have and our management options